This is the second lecture in Chapter 8, our look at the skeletal muscle system. Um, so today we're going to talk about how muscles contract and relax to allow your body to perform a whole variety of different activities and tasks. Remember that um, the other day in class we looked at the movement of um, nerves and how nerves connect to the muscles, and you saw a little diagram that looked something like this, where you had a motor neuron or a nerve that's attached to a muscle or associated with a muscle, not really attached. You had this motor nerve in, in red, and let's say this muscle is green. And you read about how little chemicals called neurotransmitters are released from this motor nerve, and they cross this little gap, this little space in the body called the synapse. The neurotransmitters cross that little gap so that the muscle can um, receive certain messages. The message that's involved pretty strongly with contraction of muscles is called acetylcholine. Let's see if I can move actually this out of the way a little bit. So when motor nerves release acetylcholine into the synapse, it diffuses across the gap. A lot of times you'll see acetylcholine um, abbreviated as ACH. So acetylcholine will diffuse across the gap between the nerve and the muscle fiber itself, and it will bond to the muscle fiber. That causes the muscle to allow in lots of sodium, um, which is a positively charged ion. It causes lots of sodium to seep into the muscle. That change in concentration, so the increase in positive charges flooding into this muscle, causes an electrical impulse. Your body actually runs on electricity, um, just like your the power in your house. And that electrical impulse spreads all over the muscle fibers into the transverse tubules, which you saw and you drew in your sketch of the muscle fibers. The tubules look sort of like that, and they're little um, kind of passageways within the muscle fiber. That allows for um, calcium that is stored up in the body and in the blood. That allows for calcium now to move through the transverse tubules and into the muscle fiber itself. Um, specifically, it moves into the sarcoplasmic reticulum. This calcium is the whole key to muscle contraction. Without the presence of calcium, um, there's no way for the muscle to contract. Um, so the reason that we need calcium is because we've got these myosin and actin fibers. Remember that your actin are the kind of thin fibers, they look like this, and your myosin are the big, fat, kind of much thicker rope-like fibers that are found kind of in the center of the sarcomere, and here we've got our Z-line and our Z-line that attaches to the actin. So the myosin actually has these what are called little cross bridges, and they look like that. They look like little hooks that stick out from the top and bottom of the myosin. So imagine that there's another one down here, and then more cross bridges, like that. Um, the only way that these fibers can change um, position is if the actin and the myosin actually bond with one another, and that is um, kind of a challenging process, and it requires a lot of different things to happen sort of simultaneously. Um, Around the actin are two other proteins. They kind of wind like this. They're called troponin and tropomyosin. And they wind around the actin and they prevent these little cross bridges actually from coming into contact with the actin. So these cross bridges want to latch onto the actin, but they're getting blocked by troponin and tropomyosin. So in order for the troponin and tropomyosin to shift position, that's where the calcium comes in. The calcium comes in and kind of um, changes the shape of those two little proteins by getting in the way of um, their wrap around the actin, and we're going to look at that. So, um, actually, I'm going to skip. Well, no, we'll stay here. When the myosin cross bridges attach to the actin, so let me scooch this up a little bit and show you what I mean. When the myosin cross bridges grab onto the actin, 
they form these little bonding sites and say this one will grab onto that actin and it, then this little cross bridge kind of ratchets over and it pulls this actin in that direction. Think of it um, like if there were a clothesline hanging between two buildings and you wanted to um, bring the clothesline closer to one of the buildings, you would grab onto it and pull with one hand and then pull with the next hand and then pull with the first hand and then pull with the next hand until the rope got closer and closer and closer to you. That's very similar to what the myosin and the actin do. Um, the myosin grabs onto the actin and then it pulls it in this direction. And what that ends up doing is it causes this overlap of myosin and actin where before they were like this, right? And there was some empty space between actin filaments. What ends up happening in contraction is the myosin pulls those actin filaments so there's virtually no space between them. So the entire sarcomere has now gotten shorter because these actins are being pulled inward towards one another, which contracts the entire muscle. So I'm gonna look, I wanna show you a graphic about this and we'll talk a little bit more about how your body uses the energy. So here again is the picture of a generalized sarcomere. So when the sarcomere is relaxed, you've got kind of a lot of space from Z band to, or Z line to Z line is the language that your book uses. So we have two sarcomeres here. Here's one and here's two from Z line to Z line is one complete sarcomere. You can see that there's a lot of um, space between the actins, right? The myosins are there in the middle, and then you've got all this empty space between the actins. That empty space is called the H zone, and it's where there's no actin at all. So as the muscle starts to contract, these actins start coming towards one another, and you can see this H zone is getting more narrow compare the H zone in gray to the H zone in gray down here to the H zone in gray down there. There is no H zone at this point. Everywhere in the sarcomere there's actin to be found. So that means the muscle is the muscle fibers are pulled as closely to one another as is possible. That is a full muscle contraction. And you can see in contraction, right, the entire muscle gets a lot shorter. So here we still have those two sarcomeres. Up here, those two sarcomeres took up this much space, or, well, that was a little overzealous. Um, the sarcomeres take up this much space. And down below, now your whole muscle is much, much smaller because it's completely contracted and overlapped another kind of graphic that shows how this happens in a very um, kind of zoomed in view. So here we've got the myosin, one little chunk of myosin, and there's its cross bridge right here. And up above we've got the actin. Now actin looks a little bit different here than it's been looking before, right? Before we've drawn the actin as just a little straight line. Well, you can see actin is actually a, it looks more like a beaded necklace. There's these little tiny amino acids, right? That's what these yellow dots are. Tiny amino acids that are all bound together to form the protein actin. But then you also have, as I mentioned earlier, you also have these um, other proteins that have kind of latched on. So we've got the troponin and the tropomyosin here, right? They're wrapping around the actin, and we've even got some that are more globular shaped, and they're just kind of stuck on in uh, regular intervals. So those guys are serving the purpose of basically making it difficult for the myosin to come into contact with the actin, which is a good thing because you don't want your muscles contracting just randomly. You want them contracting when the proper nerve impulses have been sent. So um, we use, our bodies use an energy in the form of a molecule called ATP, which stands for adenosine triphosphate, um, and that's basically the body's version of fuel. ATP is our energy source. So um, the myosin splits up the ATP into a couple of smaller parts. Um, it splits it into a big molecule, molecule called ADP and a teeny tiny little molecule called phosphate. So what happens is that teeny tiny molecule phosphate 
um, comes in there and it sort of hangs out waiting to be reunited with its big brother over here, the ADP. But the ADP allows for energy um, for the myosin to make this connection with actin. So here we've got a bond. Um, and then as the cross bridge latches on, then we need to use a little bit more energy. That's why this ADP is getting kicked out now. It's um, basically been burned up. And the myosin ratchets up. It pulls on this actin, moving it in that direction. And then we've got the original ATP that we talked about. The big molecule comes back and it reattaches to the myosin, which disconnects the myosin from the actin and allows the muscle to relax. So the um, splitting of ATP is what kicks off the contraction. The rebonding of ATP into its complete form is what stops the contraction. Um, the way that your body relaxes the muscle after um, the contraction is complete, however long that contraction needs to be, um, there's an enzyme. It's a special kind of protein called um, acetylcholinterase. Basically, ACE tells you it breaks down something called acetylcholine. So when um, this is the messenger telling your body to contract, 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 a when the enzyme acetylcholinterase comes along, it breaks down the acetylcholine and it kind of chews it up and stores it, it stores it back in the cells for later, which means that the message stops happening. Once the acetylcholinterase is broken down, all the acetylcholine, there's no more message to the muscle saying contract, contract, contract. So at that point, all of the calcium ions are released from the muscle cells. They go back into the sarcoplasmic reticulum and they just hang out there waiting for the next time that they are called upon to help with muscle contraction. There are a couple of things that have to happen in order for your body to um, have proper muscle contractions. There has to be um, enough ATP and there has to be enough calcium. Those two things are required and then um, the rest of these processes can happen. You can have the message in your body saying contract the muscle, contract the muscle, contract. But if you don't have any energy to make that contraction happen and you don't have any calcium to start that whole reaction off, then there's going to be no contraction. Without those two things, nothing can happen. Um, the other part of muscle contraction and really any cellular activity that's really important is oxygen. So um, your body has a protein called creatine phosphate, and it helps to make ATP. So it produces the energy that your body uses to um, contract muscles. When your muscles use up all of the, their energy supply, then they have to find a new supply of energy. So when all of the ATP is burned up, then the body starts burning glucose, and it uses glucose as its food source. You only have so much glucose available in your body. Remember that this is a short-term energy source. So um, you only have whatever you've eaten that day or whatever happens to be stored in your body. In order to burn the glucose, you have to have a constant supply of oxygen. You have to be breathing the whole time, and there's got to be good oxygen flow in your blood. Your muscles use oxygen and glucose together. These two things together um, allow for the production of energy. There's a specific That's a special kind of energy called aerobic energy. Aerobic means with oxygen. Um, so if you have enough oxygen, if you have enough ATP, if you have enough calcium, then the body can really contract and relax the muscles for a pretty long period of time. Um, you also have a protein in your muscles called myoglobin, which helps to kind of stockpile oxygen in the event that um, the blood supply isn't bringing enough oxygen. Um, the myoglobin is sort of like a backup source. Um, myoglobin is responsible for the color of your muscles. Um, myoglobin has a lot of iron in it. And if you've ever seen rust, you know exactly what iron looks like. They're the, the 
um, chemical reaction that forms rust is because of iron in the air. So um, iron in myoglobin gives muscles their color. This is how the muscles work when they have everything they need. They have the oxygen, they have the ATP, they have the calcium. There are times when your body does not have everything it needs. Um, perhaps you're doing much more exercise than you usually do. Um, perhaps you don't have a whole lot of glucose in your body or um, you know there are a number of other things that can cause your body to start using a second kind of respiration or a second kind of cell energy called anaerobic. That means you're running out of oxygen in the muscles. It could be because you um, are using, you're working out really hard and your body just can't keep up with the oxygen demand. So um, as your body starts to break down glucose, if it, glucose gets broken down without enough oxygen, it turns into a substance called pyruvic acid, which very quickly then turns into a substance called lactic acid. And your body uses lactic acid to make more glucose for later. But if there's not enough oxygen, then there's no way for the body to take the lactic acid and make it back into glucose. All of the things that your body does are very dependent upon oxygen. So what happens is that lactic acid just sits in the body until you have enough oxygen that it can be recycled into glucose. That sitting of lactic acid is what causes muscle soreness. So the lactic acid sits in the muscles and it feels kind of tight and it feels kind of stiff and it feels kind of sore because your muscles aren't supposed to store lactic acid. That's supposed to just be recycled right away. Um, that condition is called oxygen debt. It means you owe your body oxygen and your body is um, going to store the lactic acid until it gets the oxygen that it needs. The reversing of that process or burning up all the lactic acid is pretty slow actually. It takes your body hours and hours. Sometimes um, it can be up to a day or two. Um, which requires the muscles to um, be pretty sore until such time that all of the lactic acid gets burned up. You can help your body in that process by continuing to move the muscles, um, stretching, things like that, where there's um, little bits of muscle activity happening, but nothing that requires huge amounts of oxygen. Okay, so the very last thing we're going to talk about is muscle fatigue. So what happens when um, you have been working out a lot or you've been um, doing some type of activity that you don't generally do or haven't done in a long time? Um, that leads to a condition called muscle fatigue. And what that means is your muscles basically get too tired to contract and you temporarily lose the ability for your muscles to contract. This is not a permanent condition. This is not like being paralyzed. It just means that the muscles don't work the way they should for a period of time. It could be because there's not great blood flow to the muscles. Maybe you've had some kind of an injury and a blood vessel is damaged. It could be because you are not, your body's not producing as much of the messenger that says the, the muscles need to contract. If there's no messenger, then the muscles never contract. They just sit there. Or it could be that you have a buildup of lactic acid from um, anaerobic respiration like we just talked about. Um, another condition that's kind of closely related to muscle fatigue is muscle cramping. And I think we've talked about this in class where the muscles are being um, told to contract even though you're not choosing that. Um, for some reason, the message is being sent to the muscles to contract. This is called involuntary. You're not choosing it. And so that contraction becomes painful. Um, we'll talk a little bit more about these processes in class, and we'll do some activities looking at um, how muscles contract. So please write a summary and bring in three questions for discussion. Thank you.